Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's session of the Shielding Trainee webinar series run by Supported Return to Training. Tonight's session is about returning from shielding, the impact, adjustment, and moving forward. I'm Kerry Chadwick. I'm a National Clinical Fellow for Supported Return to Training and a Paediatric Registrar. I'm happy to facilitate tonight's session and we'll introduce the speakers shortly. We have with us today Emma Lishman, who is a clinical psychologist leading a supported return to training project um, aimed at improving the experiences of doctors that are returning um, in the North Bristol NHS Trust. And we also have Safina Watson, who's an anaesthetic registrar um, who's recently returned to clinical work after shielding. So um, I will hand over to you both now. Thank you. Great. Hello, I'm Dr. Sathina Watson, um, North Bristol Trust, working with um, Emma Lishman, who we actually have never met uh, due to shielding. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, and I'm Emma, has already been introduced. And yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've spent the past seven to eight years working with junior doctors in one form or another either through trust jobs or via the deaneries. And um, over the past few weeks of um, been more involved in doctors who are shielding due to um, my work with um, the support process. So we're really grateful for you all to join us tonight. Um, and we were, we were just talking before we came on air a little bit about how maybe for some people this might feel a little bit, um, a little bit too late really as shielding pauses tomorrow. And that is one of the things we, we might uh, touch on today, but we're really glad you're here. And we really hope that even at this kind of late stage that people find this useful and it's something that will be supportive to you over the next coming in days and weeks so okay. just to mention actually the choice of image that we've got on this slide um, because i think the word shielding is actually quite emotive in itself and i think at the beginning of the pandemic we saw a lot of shielding images the sort of military ones and then we had all the protests with sort of uh, military banners but I think actually this picture sums it up quite nicely now in terms of the face shields and us going back into the community or back into the workplace. So before we move on to thinking about the pause of shielding, returning to work, returning to community activities, we just really wanted to acknowledge the shielding journey that everyone will have been on and I, I don't need to go through this because you all know this better, better than me. Uh, but I think it's really important that we do spend a bit of time acknowledging this because the process that people have been through, uh, the experience they have, will have a significant impact on how it feels to come out of shielding. Um, you know, we know that for some people, this process has perhaps been quite smooth and quite easy, and for other people, it's been hugely complex. So we just kind of wanted to look at that a little bit. So if we move on to the impact. So the impact um, has been far ranging and I guess there is no one size fits all. So today is just really to start to open up some discussions and have a think about everybody's kind of individual experience and how that might influence things going forward. Um, for me, I've spoke to a number of doctors who have been shielding and I've been really uh, shocked at the difference in terms of the process of getting into shielding. So for some people, they were, you know, kind of marched out of the building, told that they had to shield, they, they weren't expecting it. For other people, they um, have really had to fight to shield, um, like quite, quite uh, surprising how much, you know, they've had to get letters from their consultants, from their teams to, to have the right to shield, really. And I guess, depending on how it was getting into shielding and your feelings about that will very much um, impact on how it kind of feels um, coming out the other the other side. I don't know whether you want to add any anything, Safina. Yeah, only so I'm part of a group of doctors. So there's a sort of shielding doctors network, which is an informal group. And then there's also the Facebook group, which uh, Kerry talked about yesterday. And that's the one thing that stands out uh, is that for every single shielding person, there is no one size fits all. Everyone has gone into it from a different perspective has has a, has had a different experience during it and that will very much apply for those 
who well when shielding is paused and those who are able to go back to work so that's all I wanted to just sort of emphasize that yeah and I guess that has just made me think as well that is you know the process getting into shielding has been very different but also the experience of people whilst shielding so again you know we we've had people talking about feeling very um, valued and utilized and busy and put to use in lots of kind of like jobs that have felt um, really important and other people who felt really underutilized forgotten and so again the process of these past few months has varied so massively for everyone and um, you know I've, I've spoke to quite a lot of people who feel a lot of apathy now kind of saying I can't do any more data input in you know get me back <laughs> whereas at the start might have been like oh you know give me the data input in so I think over the kind of months I guess people's feelings have changed according according to the process. So. And the only thing uh, I just wanted to say as well is when we're talking about shielding, we're obviously including in that group those that were formally uh, advised to shield by the letter, those that were advised to shield by the uh, occupational health or workplace, and then also those, the high risk people. So pregnancy, example, for example, those people who were also uh, withdrawn from the workplace. So we're using shielding in a, a broad term, really. So we'd like to hear, actually, because we have some ideas about feelings from talking to other people. But if you have uh, the Slido, uh, I'm going to pop up with the next screen. If you could share your main feelings about going back to when you first started shielding, what it felt like. And um, you could put more than one uh, more than one feeling here. In fact, I might do it myself. <laughs> So if you scan the QR code um, or use the app, hopefully it will work. Okay, great. They're starting to come through now. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'm not at all surprised that guilty has the big, uh, <laughs> the big centre ground there, really, um, with relief. A close second. This is some interesting words as well. There, shame, I've, and that that stands out to me. Worthlessness. Yeah. And for me, I think one of the things that is probably, you know, um, from speaking to people, you know, it's kind of like a pandemic, and um, you know, people that you know it's the time to do my job and work and then find yourself at home. But also the narratives in society around heroes and frontline, you know, I think this is probably really added to, to this sense. Um, yeah. It's... Yeah. I think so from my perspective, um, when I left the workplace, I mean, this guilt was enormous, but I had this sense of leaving my colleagues and I actually looked around the room the day that I left and I thought, Oh my gosh, you know, what is going to happen to these people? Whereas I'm going home to be safe, these people are not safe. And I felt very, well, just guilt about that. Um, as well as that, that other word, relief, that I was actually able to protect uh, my family. Just, I'm also noticing here about confidentiality and embarrassment. And I think that's another big theme that I've spoke to people a lot about how Con health conditions, personal situations, things that people didn't know about before were only the bare minimum of people who need to know about these things knew about. And then all of a sudden that's out there for everybody to know about, you know, team members, admin staff, you know, and it just kind of, you know, um, becoming very common knowledge about overnight about your personal information, which is... Mm. The other one that stands out though is not believed. That's something I've heard um, a lot from people actually. F this feeling of having to justify why you're not there, uh, and uh, and people not believing you, especially if you look well and have essentially been perceived as a well member of the team prior to that, possibly. As as a psychologist, I always find this really interesting. The kind of the way we talk to ourselves. So you know, if we you try and take the personal out of it slightly if you think overnight and we'll talk about this a bit more later the language overnight people were told 
you are extremely clinically vulnerable and you need to get home and you know you're not going to be doing your job and you know I think most people if you would think about what you might say to that person you'd probably say oh crikey that's awful or are you going to be okay or look after yourself or I, I can't believe you know yet the way we talk to ourselves and the way we kind of turn that into ourselves is oh that I'm you know there's things like I'm a burden I'm you know, it's it, it's often we, you know, I'm sure if you're speaking to another friend who was shielding, you probably wouldn't talk to them in this way yet. We're very much kind of um, often, yeah, talk to ourselves in quite a negative way and feel like, you know, yeah, we, we kind of jump to these kind of positions of feeling bad and feeling, um, yeah, ashamed or selfish. They're, they're very, um, yeah, it, it's, very, it's very kind of critical of ourselves, isn't it? For a situation that I'm sure nobody... <laughs> would have chosen if you know nobody would have chosen i'm just seeing other than relief um i'm not sure if there are any positive words there. i mean we'll move on to the next section in a minute but is there any positives that you could add to that um when you began shielding sleep <laughs> <laughs> and why we'll move on to the next 40 cells some sums come up but i can't see them now protected well the way they jump around it's really difficult believed <laughs> <laughs> i think they're popping up yeah but overwhelmingly obviously a very very difficult time for people <laughs> very um very emotive difficult time yeah okay thank you for that we'll go on to the next bit so okay so yeah the uh, unsurprisingly the kind of feelings that we've heard from people through talking to people are it's very um similar so um i've spoke to a lot of people around frustration and maybe that wasn't so much at the beginning actually although for many people the, the process was frustrating uh, but as time went on and I guess especially as people were shielding were you know shielding at home and then I always think frustration and anger went about VE day and everyone's kind of out on the street having a party and how that kind of must felt for people who were just waiting to be able to get out of their situation and then seeing other people maybe kind of flout the rules and things um, and of course you know the media does a good job on stuff as well often so you know the kind of side that people sort of you're not going out that's kind of kind of what what you see um and i guess frustration then i'm sure we've all had this whether we're kind of shielding or not but frustration with our own friends and family and colleagues you know with you know it you know the government's line of all this in together but actually i think for a lot of people we all felt like we were in very different situations with um covid and everyone's position was slightly different and of course frustration and anger with perhaps the political system as well and the you know the, the the situation we find ourselves in guilt we don't need to really spend too much time on and um, i think doctors generally uh, are people who kind of feel guilt quite a lot it's a high level responsibility job people go in it not you know to to do their best and to help others and be part of a team so it's not surprising to me that guilt was you know really high up there of course people may have felt scared and we're going to go on to talk about that and of course the relief that come, came with not you know with shielding i have spoke to a few people who maybe not at the beginning but as time have gone on i've kind of found some enjoyment of being with family spending more time together and um, and yeah that 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 may be the one kind of positive thing i've heard but again mainly the the emotions have kind of been negative i just wanted to add a little bit actually about what you were saying about the frustration and anger um around sort of the v day period I think, I don't know if other shielding um, doctors felt this, but that particular weekend seemed to me to be a turning point in people's feeling of frustration and powerlessness um, because they saw everyone having fun and, you know, not social distancing possibly or whatever. And it very much felt that that meant, do these people not understand, I am now going to be stuck at home for months longer, weeks longer, whatever it was. And it was at that point that um, some of us had conducted a survey of shielding doctors and that's when the true sort of impact of shielding began to be known when I started to hear about doctors who were 
isolated completely on their own or excess alcohol, fastidious cleaning, worried about their own health. And that's when it became evident that shielding was having a really big impact um, on us. Yeah. So I put this slide together really just to kind of think about um, the images and the words we've all actually had subjected to us over the past few months. And honestly, when I put this together, I felt my heart rate go up. I, um, you know, it's just none of these are new images. We've all seen them many, many times. Yet putting them together and looking at them like this and noticing, you know, the yellows, the blacks, the, the red, the threateningness of this. And basically, this is well designed, well designed to make us all feel threatened and scared because otherwise, how do you get a population to change their behaviour in a very, very quick amount of time? And, I, you know, it reminds me of somebody once told me it's a bit like the pattern on the wallpaper nobody sees, but we see it's there every day. And this has an underlying ongoing um, impact on our threat based system. And if our threat is, um, you know, we don't need much to trigger our threat system. It's, it works on an overactive, better safe than sorry principle anyway. But to be constantly subjected, even in our homes, because this was on the, the TV and through the radio and all that kind of stuff leaflets coming through and I know for yourselves letters and texts as well which the thing is going to go on to talk more about but just to really kind of illustrate the level of threat everybody's been living with and particularly more of you've been shielding over the past few months and I think it's so important to recognize this when we think about coming out the other side or pausing because um we we are feeling threatened and we are feeling frightened and so then it's no wonder that brings up kind of much more um, emotion around yeah, feeling scared and frightened, but also kind of more of the negative emotions because it's difficult for us to feel positive when we're in a threat-based system. So, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to, well, most of you will have seen this. And in fact, this shielding advice uh, is actually out of date because it was updated. But, you know, at the beginning you saw this, this advice, uh, you know, transplant recipients, rare diseases, and then you get these text messages um, from the government uh, and it says your condition means that you're at high risk of severe illness. Please remain at home. And then they go on uh, to tell you about you're allowed to open the window, do not go outside your property. And I remember receiving these myself um, and that was on behalf of my daughter because I was actually shielding by proxy. Uh, my daughter's got cystic fibrosis and they're quite I, I don't actually know the right words to receive them, to, to, sorry, to describe them. In some ways it was a relief because it meant you were on the system and it's like, oh yes, I'm shielding, I'm on the system. But there are actually quite bleak messages um, to receive. So I became quite interested in this and started researching these uh, text messages. And the, so there's a, a body that is um, part of the cabinet office, I believe, or owned by the cabinet office, some, something like that called the behavioral uh, insights team. So all of these text messages were actually designed by behavioral scientists. So what they had to do was take uh, the shielding document, which was about three and a half thousand words long, and they needed to, to, to put those into daily succinct text messages to make sure that you got the message and that you stayed at home as you were supposed to do or, or advised to do. So that's why on day one you get that one and it says you are at high risk, that's telling you how important you are and that's telling you that you need to stay inside. And then the following days, if you remember the text messages were things about shopping and that sort of stuff uh, of how to maintain your, your shielding uh, status. So I talked about this a bit earlier about uh, experiences of other shielding doctors. So I think the sort of trigger point was that VE Day weekend where we sent out a survey and that survey is actually available. It was published online in Anesthesia News. It hasn't been given a print allocation yet, but that actually was about 120 doctors from all different specialties, from all different um, stages, from F1 through to consultants and they shared their experience. So this was at the beginning of shielding. So it's quite focused on the beginning of shielding. And then more recently, um, it was either last month or this month, there was another survey that was done, um, which has been referenced in that BMJ article there, sort of focused at the end of shielding, uh, asking questions about returning to work and things like that. So the first survey we asked, basic question. So what, what are your main concerns about being shielded? 
So you can see there, the biggest impact was the, sorry, the biggest uh, concern was the impact on career. Uh, you can't see what it says there, but uncertainty about the future is that one. And then people already um, were thinking, oh gosh, how am I going to get back to work? And you can see things there about isolation, lack of support, uh, financial concerns. Um, I don't know if any of the other, any of the rest of you had financial concerns, but we had big financial worry, wondering because are we actually going to be paid during this time if, if we're off work? And guilt actually f features less there, but it's still a factor. So this was a later uh, survey, which some themes, unfortunately, considering it has been over three to four months, some of the themes were still the same. This sense of feeling forgotten about, um, not being part of the workforce. But there was some focus there. So these quotes, for example, is about how are you going to get back to work, which is why are here or not get back to work. And this idea about creating these safe COVID free or COVID green areas and things like that. But as we are all work in the healthcare profession, we all know that social distancing is not possible. We know that people may well have been exposed to the virus or be asymptomatic. We all know that the situation is going to be sort of less than ideal, really. So we've got some more questions for you, actually, just to get an idea. So the first thing to ask, and I'll pop up on the next one, so get your slidos ready, is what are your plans at, at the moment for returning to work? So you'll see there's several options, including whether you're already back at work doing the same or similar job, or whether you're doing different roles and so on and so forth. That's interesting there. We've got somebody saying also already back to work, but working from home in the chat room as well. Um, I guess perhaps we should have said that. I think we, most people we spoke to have been working the whole time, just not within the clinical setting or patient facing, doing the kind of other, other roles at home. Um, so when we're saying get back to work, we probably shouldn't be saying that because people have been working the whole time, but getting back to a clinical environment or... Um, Absolutely. We, oh, we, one, one person's put need a response because they don't know because they can't get an answer, which is, <laughs> yes, not surprising either, unfortunately. So it's interesting then. So starting in the next few weeks, about half of you doing similar. And then where is the one... So about 65% then are doing the same or similar. Um, and curiously, some might, there are no, there's no one saying they may never return to work because there are some um, shielding doctors who are saying they may never return to work, but perhaps they may not sign up for, you know, a webinar like this. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide now. Doesn't seem to be working. Hmm. This should be another word cloud. Oh, that's a shame. Is it? Can is anyone seeing it? it's not working for me, Emma? I've it? just got what you're feeling is about turning to work, but there's not. It's not. No. Oh, I'm sorry. We we tried it earlier. So the Slido uh, version is is a beta version or beta version, and sometimes it didn't work. So. Do we want people just to jot in the chat? You could do. Yeah. Why didn't you? So like cloud before um to see what feelings um see if i can fix it on here but so we've got scared yeah not keen to return nervous excited and nervous anxious now some are coming up it's just ah. not coming up on this particular image so on my um oh no it's gone no. We've got conflicted and worried about a second wave. Um, desperate to return, but feel like people are making decisions for me. I, I think that's such a big 
thing about kind of feeling done to and not having autonomy and feeling disempowered by lack of inputs to risk assessment, anxious. Mm. I'm sorry that one didn't work. It came up temporarily and it's gone, but we're getting sort of similar themes anyway. Yeah, frustrated, feel like chasing everything. Um, hope won't be doing too many face-to-face -face clinics, feel pressured to return. Yeah, nervous, worried about loss of skills. And I, and I think that's one of the things, I, my job normally is working in supportive return to training. And one of the reasons shielding came under my remit was because people have been off for three months or more. And again, when I say off, oh, just not patient facing, I do know that people have been really contributing. I must, I must really assert that. But I think that um, that the, yeah, we, you know, we do know that any kind of period of time off work, we do kind of feel like lacking in confidence and it can have a bit of an impact on our decision making. And, um, yeah, and I think what, you know, people generally find that, with, which is why it's nice it comes under the support process, because you should be getting the, all the kind of things that sit within that, the 10 days supervised practice, no one calls, no out of hours and, and have that kind of, you know, mandated for you really um, to try and help with some of that stuff what, that what happens to anyone when they have a bit of time off um, see i can see the results on my phone some of you might be able to see them but the biggest thing says anxious scared excited and worried yeah. and that you feel you've lost your skills so that's that's interesting yeah. and this there's a comment here about very keen to return but to do so within four days of shielding pausing seems ridiculous and i and i think that is the other thing it's the abruptness of all of this really it's the kind of like although you there's it's not graded it's kind of off you go you know it's um yeah i think um so the royal college of anaesthetists i don't know if anyone has managed to see the guidance but you can find it on the icm anesthesia covid hub but they um that document goes into sort of two different types of shielding so it describes community shielding which is what we're doing and then workplace shielding and we're sort of out of sync we're coming straight from our homes into the work force rather than ideally coming out of your homes getting used to the community going to the shops that sort of thing and then going to work it seems to be a transition from all you know it's an all or nothing not for everyone but for some people i have actually spoke to quite a few people about that actually who people have come back so they can start doing the other stuff because they feel guilty about going for a walk with a friend or doing something if they're not not in work and it it, it really does feel it's kind of like that that all in one and, and somebody's put here as well about worried people will ask while shielding and kind of you know having to think about those kind of questions and and yeah not having a plan and yeah these are real real concerns aren't they that are really worth you know thinking about and um there's a couple more here that i just work is the one thing we really want to get back to yes and that's that's something also I've, I keep very keen to get back yeah <laughs> someone else put worried about catching covid i know that's something i'm worried about um and then the second guessing of clinical decision making that's that's quite interesting and someone's worried about feeling not safe i don't know it's that feeling not safe in the hospital uh, or wherever you work or gp practice for example and happy some people are happy i'll go on to the next slide if that's all right is that all right emma yeah, so some of the, uh, oh, oh, yeah, no, Kelly, I'm but that's why risk assessment is essential. Community levels of affection are not, um, are not the same as clinical settings. And I think that's absolutely right. It is, the, the risk assessment is so important, um, but also people are not, they're not happening for people. Um, yeah, I think we didn't, the risk assessment, so um, Kerry will talk a bit later about it. There is a, another webinar coming up, um, but it is worth mentioning that we know that risk assessments are a big issue. We know that many people haven't had risk assessments, um, but there probably is, a, there's another webinar that will cover that sort of aspect and we, we can't really comment on, on risk assessments at the moment. Are you happy for me to go on to the next one there? So again, it's always nice to see the common theme. So this was the survey that was done right at the beginning of shielding about we asked people back then, uh, how are you feeling about returning to work? And there's a lot of anxiety about it. Um, but also I think people at that time, um, there was a lot of keenness to return to work um, because the pandemic was just starting and you felt like 
well, you're stuck at home. Perhaps I, I really should be there. And you see the night clap for carers thing and you feel that that clapping is not for you and that sort of thing. And, and you might be able to justify your feeling by going back to work. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has felt that as well. Okay, so just some kind of words, that, which again is very similar to what people in the Greek have put about returning. Um, oh, someone's put, I hated the clap for carers here. And you know, and actually I'm, I'm not shielding and I, we've, um, we're in the southwest here and so the hospital I'm at, we've been very, um, you know, we, we were very lucky, I guess, you know, quite, you know, although obviously COVID did hit, it was nowhere to the level that we thought, thought it may be. And actually, I found that a lot of people felt like that, you know, AMU, I've never known it so quiet for weeks and weeks and weeks I'd go there and people were just, and, you know, there was a lot of guilt there and kind of thinking, what are they clapping for? Because we're not, you know, actually, this is the quietest we've ever, ever been. So I think, yeah, it's, it was a very, it's an interesting, I guess it's nice to be, for the NHS to be recognised, but yeah, there is a, there's a different side to it as well. Um, so yeah, there, there's nothing new here. So um like we talked about confidentiality and um, displeased that colleagues are aware of situations the frustration about being unprepared and concerned about um, missing out and and I guess the the one thing that is um, perhaps a bit harder for doctors you know training is there is a training progression element as well you know I guess if you're because this of course is for all healthcare workers and um, and senior doctors as well but I guess if you're in a, a trust job it's slightly different you're not also having to meet training requirements and things so um yeah thinking about the kind of movement and stuff um and of course the people who are desperate to get back I self-isolated for a few weeks and I was desperate to get work back I, I honestly don't know how how you've all done it because I just found it very challenging being at home um has the invite for the webinar been released not not yet I think they'll talk about it at the end today is that right Um, so, so I guess that's the process of shielding, which you you all know um, well. So then we kind of wanted to move on to think a little bit about adjustment and think about kind of moving forwards and the next few days, weeks. Um, so the first part of that is, as we've said, just to acknowledge the emotions and acknowledge what's got, gone on already. And we know that can be quite difficult. And um, as you've all alluded to, the emotions are kind of more negative difficult emotions so but just acknowledging that that's there and that's okay and that's really really valid and that even though shielding is pausing that you know they are going to linger um because it's been um it's been a difficult time it's been a long time and um yeah it sounds like very stressful and anxiety provoking time too um obviously we've heard again and again about the lack of control and information so although we can't really address that directly here, what we can do is, I guess, as individuals and within our teams and locally try and think about what is, was it, is in our control. And I guess in a pandemic, so much stuff has been taken from our control. One of the key things is thinking about what is in my control now at this moment, this day, and starting to think about a plan, which includes some of those. And it, again, this may you know, feel difficult if you're not being that supported with that. But having a plan that you are really clear on for you, what is non-negotiable, what is not acceptable for you, so that when you start to reintroduce, um, you can yeah, kind of have your, have your bottom lines. And again, I know that can be extremely easy for me to say sitting here and very difficult when, you know, we all know the best one in the world, you can have a plan and then you go into a busy hospital setting and people aren't there or... Um, you know, the, the situation in which you expected to walk into isn't how it is and that can be very difficult to then stand up for yourself in that situation or to say this is not an option for me but I guess this is kind of quite a unique situation so kind of really kind of knowing what your bottom line is and I guess the people around you knowing that too so yeah being very aware of your boundaries and limits and we have spoke to a number of people who have already returned and have made a choice to then alter that alter that return like not sitting meetings and um, you know find out they get there and they are on call and that's that's not negotiable and um, not doing it but i you know i know it's very difficult especially in a hierarchical system to be able to stand up and say that and um, especially when you don't want to talk about why or um be seen as a nuisance or further guilt um so yeah i guess it's a real challenge just wanted to add a little bit about sort of knowing your boundaries and limits um, for those of you who have gone back to work or haven't yet gone back to work. 
I set myself some boundaries and limits mentally and I found myself in a few situations where I thought perhaps I'll just do that that'll be okay for a second and so I found myself questioning and feeling that I had to justify but actually I said no these are the boundaries and limits I've set for myself and when I start to break those uh, basically they're broken so to speak um so as long as i can keep doing those for example then i will feel safe in myself and luckily by explaining that to the people around me um, people have understood and that might have been something related to ppe um, that was available or ppe usage or something because there are i have noticed going back there are some reasonable sort of corner cuttings going on but as a person coming from returning from shielding I am not going to cut those corners, even though what I'm doing is the official line, if you, if you see what I mean. Uh, and another boundary limit, which people always think, well, I, I, it makes me think that I'm sounding like I'm completely barking mad or OCD, is, is things like sitting in the coffee room, taking a tea bag from a communal sort of tea bag sharing pot. It's whatever you're comfortable with, really. Uh, and, you know, take your own tea bags, take your own lunch, whatever it is, but have your boundaries. Uh, and I think that helps with the adjustment of going back to work. And please do educate people as well. So for me personally, until I really met, met Safina and was talking to her and other people shared in, I learned so much and I've altered my behaviour massively. Um, because, of course, I was in the hospital when there was no social distancing and no masks. And, I think we all just got into a bubble where we didn't really it didn't really seem to matter and then it was only when I started speaking to people and realized the impact that behavior would be having on other people practically physically psychologically you know I stopped moaning about having to wear a mask and just think wear your mask this is the worst thing that you've got to do really you know and also then we in our trust have started writing, writing guidance for the teams about how to talk to people coming back what to think out and I think that you know sometimes um it kind of, yes, and not just colleagues, patients, children too, absolutely. And I, and I think that, every, you know, it's not an excuse, but I think with everyone's been so bogged down in their own stuff, this has just been such a, I hate to say the word unprecedented, but such an unusual situation. I think we perhaps haven't all got the same bandwidth or the same empathy or the same kind of, um, yeah, you know, um, maybe being as good a person as we would hope to normally be and I've certainly made some mistakes but I do think do try and educate people and do let people know and we've got that we've made a little video that we'd be happy to share which Safina you know is in about people's experiences but I just think people are so into their own world that often they don't realize and when they do realize I can't I don't know many of my colleagues who would say oh you know wouldn't say of course <laughs> you know I just I just haven't thought of it so I think Although it may feel very frustrating, I, I, I do think some of it's ignorance um, and ignorance that can perhaps be understood a little bit more in the context where we're in. So do educate if you can. I feel you can. I know probably that feels really annoying because it shouldn't be on you, but, you know. So. So talk about that, just acknowledging that um, a lot of shielding people feel that it's all led by them and um because i can fully say sometimes you just can't be bothered to correct someone or you just haven't got the energy left to say can you put your mask on or you don't feel comfortable saying that um so i just want to acknowledge those of you that might not feel comfortable doing that but hopefully there are other people there that will have spoken out and that can also be people who are non-shielding colleagues so you know everyone's got a responsibility to look after everyone within their and at home of course yeah yeah and like somebody just said on the chat even if it's not for yourself for the patients I mean sometimes it feels easier to do things for you know and yeah well hopefully once you get a few advocates more and more people will will talk about it and yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, tips for returning to work okay so again um, just kind of acknowledging the fears of uncertainty the indecision and um, the risk excitement whatever's coming up and then i guess we were thinking about how this decision to return or what to return to and what that might look like and what your boundaries are or are not is it is a dynamic decision what you decide today may not be how you feel in a week or how you even feel tomorrow and it's the dynamic decision based set on um so many different factors you know you know your personal psychological factors your social situation your your health condition or the health condition um, of those that you're shielding um, by proxy for, 
the community transmission, how people are behaving. It's such a complicated decision. And I guess what, what you kind of decide now might, might change and being open to that and also allowing yourself not to feel too trapped by a decision that you make today because it, you know, hopefully if you're in a supportive team or department, it can have some, some flex. And I guess, and even if you're not, there perhaps are ways to make sure that you are able to change your decisions as, as you go along. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, you know, in terms of... Yeah, just to sort of say that um, hopefully if there are any educators or supervisors or people listening to understand that um, any trainee making a decision may well come back to you the next day or the next week and say, do you know, what? actually, I don't think that was the right decision. And um, people should be supported in that and I know that's difficult for rotors and all that sort of stuff but I guess some of that would come under the sort of supported return to work uh, aspect um, I guess it's about pushing not pushing people too quickly into a situation where they might feel uncomfortable and, and want to get themselves out of and that's another really great reason that this does sit within the support process because you know, you, you have your pre-return meeting and then you'll have your meeting to see how things are kind of going 10 days later or in and around that point. And there is room for there if things don't feel right or things don't feel comfortable to have that period extended. It isn't set in stone. So, you know, even though the, the shield guidance is new, the supported return to training um, is, is mandate, you know, it's mandated. People know about it. I mean, it's perhaps not as embedded as we would hope, but it has, you know, a lot more people are aware of those structures. And so making yourself really familiar with those and hopefully those of you who listened last night will know a lot more about that now and um, knowing um that you can change your mind uh, depending on how you feel and how it goes when you get back um so of course talking to others it's great that you're all here tonight listening to us talk and sharing your comments in the box but you know either with the facebook groups or other shelters but also you know just your colleagues friends family and i know in medicine it can sometimes be a bit difficult to talk about how we feel because it is um um you know co competitive and you kind of don't want to be seen as being the nurses but you know this is yeah do talk to others and quite often when we talk to others we find other people have, have similar things going on um and i guess we're going to talk a bit more about this but starting to think about the level of risk that feels acceptable acceptable to you um i'm just noticing in the chats there's something about everyone should have a pre-return meeting and also somebody asking about the facebook group Sabina, I don't know. yeah well I'll pop that um, at the end actually. I was going to just add something about talking to others is from talking to other shielding doctors. Sometimes it's very difficult to put this correctly but sometimes you might go through the official channels and not get the correct answer. Um, so what I would say is you just go and talk to someone else, talk to HR, talk to occupational health if you can, talk to your educational supervisor, talk to the TPD, talk to a clinical doctor, anyone else uh, it, it, that might be able to help you basically. I think don't accept one answer as being the correct. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of information out there and I think a lot of people don't necessarily have the correct information to hand when they're answering a question. Yeah. And then just talking about this, what, uh, uh, this what level of risk we can accept. And I think the coming back from shielding, there is never going to be no risk. And it's about what level, literally saying to yourself or your family, what level of risk can I accept? What level of risk makes me feel comfortable uh, and able to go back to work or not to go back to work? Yeah. So in doing that risk, we were thinking it's that risk assessment for yourself. And I, I don't mean that as a formal risk assessment, but your level of risk, there's lots of um, things to take into account. And when you were just kind of saying then about talking to your family, one of the kind of things I've heard quite a lot is about people wanting to come back to work, but their family being very keen that they don't want them to come back to work. So also managing other people's fears and anxieties around um, so yeah, in terms of that, the psychology of shielding, like we've talked about, the language, the level of threat we're under, how frightened we are. And um, quite often with fear, the more we do stuff, the more we familiarise ourselves with it, even though it's actually, you know, dangerous, whatever, you know, we become kind of less risk averse. And I think most people I've spoken to as we've come back in, it's felt a bit easier. But again, having those kind of real bottom line about what is what is not acceptable. And um, thinking about practicalities of turn, returning to work, so you know 
uh, where I work, it's all one ways and everything now, but thinking about is the certain ways of getting in the PPE, the badge, the, you know, the computers, maybe having, you know, just making yourself as safe as possible and kind of like really thinking about that within your own environment. Of course, the, the risk, the um, community risk is ever changing and also really ever changing in different areas as well. So of course, I don't know if any of you are in Leicester, but I guess it would feel very different if you're in Leicester now to what it would if you're uh, here in the Southwest. And um, so just kind of also really acknowledging that actually where you are, what department you work in, what hospital you work in. We had Western recently, um, you know, a few weeks ago, had a bit of a spike. And so just kind of really, I know you will all be aware of that, but just kind of knowing that just because what somebody else is doing isn't necessarily right for you. Again, thinking about your own workplace, uh, they're different. And of course, if you're uh, shielding by proxy, what the risk is to, to others. Um, and just again, this fact that this is all changing and all dynamic. So it is really complex and it is really challenging. Um, so if people are struggling with this and feeling really ambivalent and confused, that would be you know, really, really normal and you know, really challenging um, kind of situations to, to find yourself in, especially for people who often do get answers and kind of work in ways where there are answers and things can be fixed, this is a very, you know, I imagine very difficult kind of um, problem to be trying to face with. Uh, someone's put um, about knowing other doctors here um, in the hospital. I'd, yeah, I can't imagine there isn't more than one doctor not shielding in a hospital, but again, it's quite difficult. And even like, you know, for people to find out, it's, it's very hard, you know, there isn't kind of, you know, but maybe the Facebook group might be a way of helping with that. I'm sorry, I watched a webinar recently where someone had forgotten to plug in their laptop and it was about to die. I thought, what a buffoon! I've just done the same thing. That's why I've just <laughs> bent and plugged my laptop in so the presentation will carry on. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so sort of communication, which we talked about with sort of talking to people um, the HEE guidance, which um, will be coming out shortly or being expanded shortly, uh, deanery guidance, talking to your supervisors, college tutors, and then so find a supported return to work champion. We have them here or, or someone that works within that department, talk to peers, and not forgetting there are other resources available, such as the BMA, there's 24-7 counselling, uh, and then your professional support units or uh, professional support areas. Uh, it's just about knowing there are lots of different places to talk, lots of different places you can talk to people, which I'm sure many of you already know that and are already using this, but it's just a reminder, really. I just wanted to add to that, you know, the, the feelings that have come up, you know, they're really kind of normal to this situation, and we, you know, we don't need to kind of pathologize or anything but if you know I have spoke to a number of people who are extremely anxious and extremely frightened above you know uh, and so there is support the BMA and the health professionals and um, health for health professionals there's lots and lots of support at the minute so if you and these this is available for your family as well so if you're feeling okay about you coming back but your partner isn't or your mum isn't or whatever the BMA you know so and you don't have to be a member so do and there's lots, you know, there's lots of support with this, uh, with this anxiety and, you know, uh, the frustration and the guilt. So if people do feel that's tipping more over into having a real impact on their well-being, then do do ask for some help with that because that is readily available at the moment. Yeah. So I just was going to talk about this sort of feeling of control. I think a lot of... Um, going into shielding is sort of a sense of a lack of control you're powerless um certainly at the beginning i remember watching the daily briefings and looking at the numbers how many cases how many deaths and became sort of obsessed with it for a bit really and i think that can be overwhelming and all that did really was enhance my sense of powerlessness so i couldn't control any of those things so the way that I've dealt with it now in terms of going back to work is to just to control what I can, whether it is taking my own tea bags or, you know, silly things as well as the bigger things. Uh, and in terms of returning to work about making a plan that you, um, your occupational health or whoever you're talking to feel comfortable with. So in our case, that involved our daughter's medical team. Uh, I discussed my plan with them. And then also we've been quite bleak and we, we had a discussion about this beforehand uh, about we're really bleak, but it, is this because the subject matter is bleak? 
Um, but then there are some good aspects to it. So what I decided to do was to plan for success and I planned for disappointment as well. So I planned that I would just return to work and everything would go swimmingly well. But I also had in the back of my mind, what if it doesn't? So I should also have a, a plan for disappointment about my return to work. And, but that gives a sense of control. So it's not something that's thrust upon me. It's something that just happened. And I think with control it's to look at like what areas really bother me. Okay, so which bits about returning to work or shielding or whatever it is, what really bother me? What can I do? Is there anything I can do about those to, to make me, myself feel more in control of those? And then for me, because I'm working uh, anesthesia and we do aerosol generating procedures, for me, something that I wanted to control was my PPE, sense of PPE. So I wanted to know what PPE they had, what PPE I was going to wear, what PPE I felt safe and comfortable with. And I sort of had my idea of what, I, what, I, what was acceptable for me, obviously with what's provided in the hospital. And as I alluded to earlier, I'm sort of setting my own standards and that gives me a, a, a feeling of control and not cutting corners, not you know, um, forgetting to press your mask down firmly or what, whatever it is. So just briefly, I've already alluded to it. So um, talking about going back to work. So I've been back at work since about the 6th of July. And that plan was discussed with my daughter's medical team, every element of risk and all the evidence that was available uh, at the time was looked at. And unfortunately, as I'm sure many of you have experienced with shielding is because shielders have shielded so well, there isn't well, there isn't the information about what happens to someone that's got cystic fibrosis that gets coronavirus. There's been so few cases, you can't draw any conclusions. So all the evidence I was looking for that was going to help my decision making wasn't actually there. So I had to look at all the different risk uh, paths and decide, okay, which level of risk is willing, are we willing to, to live with? So in doing sort of in returning to work, I spoke to my educational supervisor, I spoke to the department and we decided upon this date. Uh, and But I said on that date of return that this will be contingent upon me having a risk assessment and if I, I haven't had occupational health advice, but if I had on what they said. So the plan that we came up with um, together was for me to work in the green areas, which I think other hospitals call them different sort of names but essentially areas where patients have already been tested and should have been self-isolating and so on and so forth basically limiting my potential exposure to uh, COVID. Having said that of course I think as many of you are probably concerned about my main risk I think for exposure to COVID are my work colleagues uh, and in you know in this coffee rooms and staff rooms and things like that. So I think many of us, if you go about six months and they would have said, hey, your, your training is going to come to a complete halt, it would have been quite shocked. So I was quite surprised that I was suddenly in a situation where I was needing a supported return to work because I'd never actually imagined that I would need that. But in fact, it was extremely helpful and um, we planned this stage return. So luckily, my uh, supervisor was very sympathetic. So the day one... Um, the goal was simply to walk onto the hospital premises and to check my ID badge was going to work. Because um, apparently if you haven't been in the building for three months, your ID badge doesn't work and it didn't work. So I went in and got my ID badge reactivated. I walked into the department and that was really weird. I walked into the department that would have previously been full of people chatting and um, talking and it was completely empty. And it was really, really odd, but actually I felt a little bit safer seeing that. And then I went home. Then the next day I went in, I had my fit testing and uh, PPE uh, and donning and doffing practice. And then I went home. So I was only in for about an hour. And then I commenced on half days uh, and supervised and so on and so forth. So I'm still on a, a phased return to work, um, but I'm actually on annual leave. And that's something that Emma actually told me um, to do is that I'd, had annual leave pre-booked and I felt immensely guilty for taking my annual leave but Emma said no you must take your annual leave so I'm now on annual leave so I'm going back again uh, to, to complete my supportive return to well, I asked you to do this for me on your annual leave <laughs> never mind 
hopefully everyone's story is totally different yeah um, but that's just a little bit of what what can be done really and um and you know on the annual leave front i've spoken to so many people who are not taking their leave but like you know if we're talking about you know you have been working you're entitled to annual leave you're entitled to a break you're entitled to now the shielding's ended doing something else you know and and I know people feel guilty, but I honestly pe think people feel guilty anyway at the moment about, you know, so if you can not let that override you and, and have a break, uh, I think, you know, gosh, I mean, especially, well, I don't know what people's situations are, but being in with the children for three months, that's, uh, that's a challenge. So, yeah, I think if people can allow themselves to have that, that is important. Nice. So just wanted, we also wanted to make sure we acknowledge the people that aren't returning to work because as, as the shielding is paused, there are some people that can't return to work and that might be due to their ongoing health condition, might be due to their risk assessment outcome. And in fact, some hospitals um, that I've heard of are just saying to anyone that's been shielding, we cannot provide you a COVID secure uh, help, uh, workplace, so please stay at home until we give you further advice. And I just want to make reference as well to this the health and safety safety executive website um, has got a lot of information about the legal responsibility of, legal responsibilities of workplaces to make the place covid secure so i if anyone's having any problems i would definitely have a look on there to see as to what uh, where your sort of what the hospital has to do for you so just talking about people that aren't returning to work as well and, and just to acknowledge that there are mixed feelings about that. Some people are gutted that they can't get back to work and they are desperate. They have had enough of working from home for 20 weeks or 21 weeks and want to go back to work. So being told they can't go back to work is actually quite upsetting. But then there are others that are feeling, oh, thank goodness for that. Um, that, that is it's too for me to deal with at this time. So for anyone, again, as, as we all, and that's why we're all here, is to go and find support uh, and talk to people about your decision about, you know, if you're deciding to do another career or go to do a different sort of work practice that you weren't anticipating. And that was something I've discovered through this, actually. There is a group of doctors who are non-patient facing doctors uh, that was pre-COVID, actually. I didn't know about that before, but... There is some support networks for, um, you know, presumably their underlying health condition meant that uh, hospital work wasn't appropriate, you know, at, you know, not just because of COVID, but normal seasonal flu and et cetera. So I think there are some support networks around that and um, that if people aren't aware about it might be, um, I think there's been some meetings around that recently. So. Okay, so moving forwards, and we, we we wanted to try and be a bit more positive, but we were we were finding it slightly slightly tricky, really. So I guess we have to all be aware of the language that it is a pause in shielding. Let's hope it's a, a long pause or a, an eternal pause, because I don't, you know, um, but that you know there is, I guess there is risks and things in Europe aren't exactly looking great at the moment. So there is this risk of this second wave or. Or surges and again that might be very individual because that might be location based but just that kind of planning and and i guess some of the stuff there's you know about that a lot of this stuff has come a bit late i really hope we learn and if this happens again that uh, people are really given jobs because one of my things that i've really felt for some people is they've just been given the most mundane difficult jobs at home and it's just left them feeling really awful so hopefully we can think of like quite creative ways of making sure that people are really valued got projects and and yeah i know the deaneries i have been have been thinking about that um obviously hopefully we're, we're going to get a vaccine please um but i guess yeah thinking about training options um i know the deanery uh near where i am uh, they've got some funding they've got bursaries for doctors that are continuing to shield so they can do educational qualifications um, and then I guess as the thing is alluded to we do know that some people are thinking about alternative careers this has kind of made them either for their health but also just kind of what this is what this has done I know that has made some people think about retirement as well or not retiring um, and yes thinking again about that level of risk and one of the things we have talked about quite a lot is that we all do live with a lot of risk anyway and especially people with health conditions you know there is a kind of level of risk that people kind of accept to live with and i guess what this has done is just added such a kind of bombshell to that and thrown it all out of the water but 
actually people are really really good like you will be really really good at managing risk and thinking about it and thinking about what you need for your health or other people's health but i guess this was just so quick and so emotive you know i guess every day we go out in our cars we take a risk and i know it's not comparable but if we then had uh, all the stats every day about how many people died we would you know it would you know so i guess it's just about thinking i know this is is a risk but also thinking about what what level of risk can you live with? What level of risk can you accept? And that's going to be very, very personal. Um, but I know that people are really, um, yeah, really problem with that. And people are like, yeah. And I guess the longer it's gone on for, what my, I've seen that a lot of people are accepting a lot more risk the longer this this goes on because I guess it's becoming more part of our our lives. I don't know whether you want to add to that. Too. Yeah, I guess there's also because we're talking about physical risk of yeah. coronavirus, but there's your risk to your mental health, isn't there? Which for some people that the risk to their mental health is actually greater than the risk of coronavirus. So um, they're doing things that perhaps they thought they wouldn't be doing uh, for their to, to feel fun and to feel that they're living life again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So hopefully, I just thank you so much for listening. And um, these were the things that I was talking about earlier. Um, the photos that I used are from this website. Uh, and th there's a Twitter group of shielding doctors um, that shares information and things like that. And then the Facebook group, um, which this is also going to be, it's also in the HEE um, resources document. Um, that Kerry will talk about, but there is a shielding healthcare workers. So that's not just doctors, that's everyone that works in healthcare. So from admin to nursing to, to anyone. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of discussion in that group actually about uh, risk assessments and people not going to work and problems and solutions and all sorts of stuff. So thank you very much. And I look forward to looking at some of the comments because I can't see them on my screen. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Emma and Sabina. That's really, really useful. Um, and is there's lots and lots of um, chat. And I know you've been answering a lot of the questions and a lot of the points that have come up as we've gone along. Um, one of the things that you've touched upon was um, this feeling of kind of change of identity um, and people that were previously, you know, um, not seeing themselves as patients um, and suddenly being put into this group where they're seen as high risk and to, to kind of to accept that change in how you feel about yourself. Um, when we all take risks in that work environment every day, um, but suddenly that risk feels so much more um, palpable and so much more real. Is there anything um, else that, that you guys wanted to wanted to say about that and how people can kind of um, accept that change or um, think about how they adapt to um, it's really a, really, a really different set of circumstances and a really different kind of way in seeing yourself or seeing your loved ones. It's really difficult, isn't it? It's personal. I think it's personal and individual and, and ever changing and I think as we get more information about the outcomes of the virus and things like that, then we can balance it against other sort of commoner risks. So, for example, today I was talking um, about, so my daughter with cystic fibrosis, and we were talking about the risk of coronavirus. And then I realised, actually, I've always potentially exposed her to bugs in the hospital. So I've taken home a multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, which had an extremely... Uh, would have had quite a significant impact on her life trajectory had she not cleared it. And then there's a, there are several other bugs of which I would be exposed to in intensive care. And I've, luckily in my training, I've always had a supportive intensive care consultant, which I've just said, look, I, can't, I would prefer not to go into that room. So then I looked at that and thought, actually, it looks possible that the risk of coronavirus might actually be less than the risks of those, but I don't know that yet. So, yeah. yeah. From my point of view, I, I think it's a process and I think that's part of the problem with this. It's happened so quickly. Um, and, you know, um, most people are sure them, you know, will, will have an ongoing kind of health condition or have had, you know, something which causes immunosuppressants or 
chemotherapy and you know just like that just like when you get diagnosed with something or when you find out you've got cancer you've got to go treat it's, it's a process you know you kind of adjust over time and it's there's the whole kind of you know i guess like a bereavement all the and emotions and you know your tra trajectory is different things have changed and i guess the difficulty with this is we just don't know we've not and human beings we love a story we love them a start a middle and an end what we don't like is this unknown uncertainty so i just think this process is just it although it, uh, it probably feels like a long time in many ways actually it's a very short amount of time to get our heads around something so new so difficult um, and i know i've spoken to quite a few people who have been shielding for cancer and and treatment and actually doing really really well managed everything's kind of stable and this has actually brought up a lot again about being ill being at home sat on the sofa and i guess so there's also a lot that can you know something that was kind of a bit put to bed and you know you're managing it you're dealing with it or you know i guess lots of conditions that are managed well day to day and this has kind of brought up that kind of being ill or you know um having a disability and people that's really really difficult for people so all like i said they're not an answer but just really be kind to yourselves give yourself a break you know don't you know try not to be too self-critical beat yourself up this is a process and it's incredibly difficult for any of us to get our heads around never mind if we've got other th other things that complicate it as well so i mean i think it'll make a difference now you know it's it's kind of difficult enough getting a diagnosis anyway but getting a diagnosis now knowing covid's there as well it's it's really going to add another layer to complexity of health and healthcare. Hi. um and i i guess touching up upon that it's a bit difficult sometimes um i hear this from um returners who have had you know personal circumstances or um medical problems going back into that environment there's a lot of anxiety about what questions are people going to ask me what am i going to have to kind of talk about um that is personal to me and that's confidential um and one thing that i would say is quite useful is to find somebody that you um trust not to kind of pass on those confidential e um, information but to have a conversation with um your supervisor about the important people that need to know when you go back so you know the consultant on call they know that you've been shielding not necessarily any of the medical information but so that you're not asked those questions in a big group or made to feel uncomfortable so how do you go about some of that information sharing but keeping those those details away from the the wider group is really difficult as well and i think causes a lot of anxiety for for a lot going, of people thinking to, about going back something that we didn't uh, touch upon which is absolutely vitally important is of course the change over next week um which for a lot of people who are changing over having to have those discussions with people that you don't know they might not know you or you might have been there beforehand or you know it, it's quite it can feel quite intrusive and it's unfortunate that the pause in shielding i wish the government had organized it for a different week uh, happens to coincide with a big week for for doctors in training and with that i would say have some lines have some things ready plan that you're prepared to say or or not say you know sometimes being put on the spot with these questions is hugely difficult but if you've got a couple of one-liners about where you you know that are very clear that that's what you're willing to say and that that is it you know and that you feel comfortable with and um, because yeah that can ease that in that moment when people ask it's a very surprising the amount of information people will ask people it's uh, um, and i guess the other thing is in busy hospitals quite often people won't even realize anyone's been away they just think oh just been an end of, you know, there was all redeployment, there was all different stuff, people might not even know. So it, in some cases it might be important, it's a bit like when people return for mat leave or anything else with the support process, sometimes it is important to say, well, actually I've, I've not been patient facing, I've not been clinical, uh, just so people know that you've not been there for three months, but also then being to have a sentence that you're happy with, which will explain that, that doesn't then lead to a load of questions about your personal circumstance. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and have maybe in in your mind some ideas about um if you find yourself in a situation where you're really uncomfortable and there isn't kind of the ppe that you want or um you feel like you know as Fina's talked about just being in the coffee room and all of those day-to-day -day things that make you feel really at risk where are you going to draw your lines i suppose and um how are you going to escalate that you know what are your what are your first ports of call within that trust and and 
or who can who can you access is worthwhile just trying to have in, in mind I suppose before you go back as well. Absolutely. I'm just seeing if there are any questions that we haven't answered there that there was a few comments about um progression in the Q and A and um I know you touched about uh, touched upon kind of career decisions and how this kind of had a real kind of impact on on what your plans are for the future um, but there's a lot of people in kind of transition points anyway so coming up to CCT or changing um, or changing um, kind of roles from foundation to specialty or from core training to higher specialty and I think that can be quite difficult um, as well. I don't know if you've got any any comments or thoughts about that? Well, I was going to say, I think, you know, let's say best case scenario, we don't go back into shielding, but let's say if we do go back into shielding, I think now that the document, I know every, there's been a lot of criticism that there's things have been delayed to get from sort of official bodies, but the information is now there and there are plans uh, to deal with sort of uh, breaks in training and CCTs and exams and all that sort of stuff. So hopefully the information is there and we can look at that and hopefully that will be updated as well as things change or don't change. Yeah, and I'll, I'll um, post a, a link at the end to um, one of the resources lists and there's some HE guidance about training there. Um, and another place to look is um, potentially the, the Royal College um, websites because a lot of them have looked into um, what kind of things that are specialty specific you can continue to do. Um, and I think um, a couple of people have touched upon, you know, surgical skills. And I know you've talked about anaesthetics and all of the procedures that have to happen and, and getting, getting adjusted to not being able to be in that environment is really difficult. Um, and just balancing different workload, I think, as well, because lots of people are running clinics and things at home and actually being given a lot of admin work and a lot of projects and a lot of things that um, they wouldn't ordinarily be doing. Someone's put something in here about induction next week. I've lost the question now, it's bump, bumped away about any of that ALS as well. Um, a few about that kind of thing. Um, so I, so hopefully most trusts, I think it's in their best interest, isn't it? They've got a duty of care to their employers. I think many trusts are hoping to do uh, virtual inductions. And I would say if you have not been offered a virtual induction, I would definitely ask, you know, have you got a virtual induction? And if they haven't, I, I would bit bullshit I would say okay well what's the room capacity how you know how many people are going to be there I am I am returning from shielding uh, and it may be that they haven't thought that through and they may happily set up a, 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 a virtual induction um, and then this thing about ALS as well I because I've I've actually got to redo my ALS and I've seen some people doing it and I think those courses are planning socially distanced courses um, but that doesn't deal with the question that that person had about this red, so red, <laughs> red people walking into green areas type thing. And I really don't know the solution to that, but um, that is one of the, I, so I work in a green ward, but people come up, sorry, green level, but people come up from red level. And I, I really don't know what solution is if perhaps someone might have one of what works in their hospital. I don't have a solution to that, but in terms of both the induction and the courses, I think the best thing is if you can try and get an ally at the hospital or your place of work, somebody you can kind of trust and talk to. And if not, through the support programme, you know, we have support champions where we are, but I don't know what different regions have, but there's support um, uh, programmes in every area. And just try and find, because quite often it's so much more difficult to do this from home where you're kind of like trying to email people and get hold of people and find the right people. But if you can just get someone who's there on the ground, who can go and check some of this out for you. You know, like I went to the, you know, the, the junior docs inductions and they were the really, really um, well spaced out where, you know, I was, you know, and if you at least get someone who can go and kind of reassure you and, you know, help you figure out which entrance you might be better going in, but you kind of almost just need someone who's there you know, anyone, even or a colleague, I guess, but trying to find somebody who can kind of perhaps go and knock on people's doors, especially if you're kind of feeling already guilty and 
not wanting to you know be a burden or put yourself forward because of what you know what everyone's already said if you could perhaps find somebody else who can just be a bit bullshit for you in this situation and then in the future you can be bullshit for them when it comes to something else but yeah do um i've i've asked quite a few requests on people's behalves because it just feels easier coming from me and actually most people when they've realized i've been like oh gosh yeah i hadn't thought but um so if you can find somebody who can ask these questions on your, yeah on your behalf yeah, and the um, other thing that was mentioned um, yesterday is the guardians of safe working as well can sometimes be good people to contact if there isn't um, a support champion or, um, you know, you feel like it's it's more related to contact them. Um, and I guess, although this webinar is aimed at um, trainees, there's been lots and lots of trainers that have contacted me to ask if they can um, watch it or if they can see the recording afterwards. And I suppose that in itself is really positive. Um, the, there is people there that want to help, but it's obviously um, sometimes a bit difficult to know who to speak to, isn't it? Yeah, I've spoke to loads of trainers who are just saying we just don't know what to do, but like it's not, yeah, again, it's a role that people didn't suddenly expect especially when you know around the risk assessment and stuff and it's not a training issue of course but that's often the person's first point of contact so yeah i think again talking to people raising these concerns hopefully people will get a, a positive response i don't know that i'm being too optimistic that i don't know <laughs> yeah someone's made one other comment that i just wanted to, which is quite quite a good one about what someone might say to you, oh, so-and-so shielding, they've had asthma, they've done this, they've done that, and this has gone really well from them. And it's perfectly, you know, it's going to be different for every single person. So any trainers listening, just because something worked well for one person with exactly the same condition or exactly whatever, it might be completely the wrong thing uh, for the other person with the same condition. So that's really important that people understand that and not to ever say, Oh, well, so-and-so did well with this and it was okay for so-and-so and they don't mind having that PPE and they don't mind not wearing this. Uh, it, that's not really acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's so many different individual circumstances, isn't there? And even, you know, we, we mentioned about home working and people's um, environments and responsibilities that have changed because of um, COVID and shielding as well so you know child care looking after um, dependents all of those things can 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 make your normal um, kind of working environment so much different um, and I think it's important not to put too much pressure on um, on yourself to match up to people <laughs> um, that have that have you know been able to work from home there's different access to resources there's different circumstances um, and I think someone someone has mentioned in the in the chat that um, for those who feel like you're not doing enough your time will like your time will come and I think um, you know Emma you, you you really touched upon it with all of the talk about heroes and being on the front line and all of those things and I wasn't in a clinical environment at that point either and actually it really does feel like you want to be there and people are having all of these experiences and all of these changing um, circumstances with Covid and you're normally a real part of that team and that's part of your every everyday experiences and actually to feel distanced from that is really hard and then to deal with all of the change in circumstances and the pressure to feel like you're doing something to make up for that can be really difficult I think um, so I think people it's, it's easier said than done um, but I think people really do need to recognize that whatever they're doing they're doing enough and they're doing what they can in their own circumstances um, and it's the same when you go back to work I think um, you know you can't expect yourself to be exactly the same as as you were when when you left or when all of this started because things have changed so much and um, things around you and your commitments have changed so much as well. For me personally, I think shielding is probably one of the biggest sacrifices people have made. I just honestly, like, I know there's about personal protection here, but part of the level was about protecting the NHS. And that's a bit of a tough line. You've got to stay in to protect the NHS or something. You know, and I actually think what a sacrifice people have made in terms of not seeing friends and family, not 
doing their jobs not get i just think it's it, it it's huge absolutely huge and i honestly don't know how you've all done it so i just think um yeah it's yeah to yeah well i just keep saying it but you know really to kind of recognize that and try and realize you know what you know it's it's a it's a huge thing staying home is a huge thing that is so yeah out of our you know there's a, there's a lot of talk in the psychology world about the language and everything that's been used and sort of kind of social distancing being a big mistake and we should have used stuff like safe relating and uh the fact that you know actually we're we're, we're social animals we need connection we need other humans and, and you know and i know lots of people have been staying in apartments so they're not can work and not go to the kids or not seeing this person or not you know these are huge huge sacrifices that people have made and i really think that needs recognizing and i'm you know i'd be really sorry to hear that that, that wasn't the reaction people were getting because i personally think it's, it was a huge ask yeah you know yeah, just to say reiterate that and say well done me and well done everyone that we have all managed to do it and and also just to mention the shielding by proxy group because i see, see a little note there from someone who's shielding by proxy and that we've been shielding by proxy and that has a sort of different level of guilt with it because i am well but yet i'm not in the workforce but my risk is not me my risk is my family so just saying big up the shielding by proxy people as well absolutely and it also has a different thing about going back because if you're going back because of you you're making a decision about your own risk you're making a decision about a family a partner a child that is that's another level of that as well so i again i, I you know I, I find it so unfortunate that people shielding by proxy are getting a hard time because actually in some ways it's it's more more complicated in some ways well some of some were told to move out weren't they some were told yeah. Well, you must leave the home and some did some did leave the home by choice you know willingly with family support and some left the home sort of through guilt uh, and some you know some shielding by proxy stayed in the home and weren't able to do any work because they were looking after children or looking after sick family members because i know carers some level of carers were removed uh, from many people so it's been a big ask uh, and um hopefully we've done it and we won't need to do it again I think that's part of it as well, isn't it? Um, even the term shielding makes you feel like you're protecting yourself against everything else, but it's it's really not about that. Uh, there's so many more people involved in all of those decisions. Um, yeah, uh, and cocooning is almost a little bit better, <laughs> um, but there's no perfect term, is there? But it's definitely, it's it's about all of those connections and all of those loved ones, whether you're shielding for yourself or by proxy or um, for any reason, really. Yeah. Um, touching on that, there's um, a couple of mentions about high risk groups um, in the question and answer. Um, if, if either of you have got anything to say about that, then please do go ahead. But um, in the occupational health webinar, um, there, there will be um, some information on that as well in terms of from a, a risk point of view and a risk assessment point of view. Um, what, does, what does that mean and, and um, what is the kind of overview um, of, of being in that situation? Um, it's really difficult, but I don't know if there's anything that, that you guys wanted to add before that I session on Monday. That session and then um, that the, the occupational health and the risk assessment session. There's also a question in there about pay protection and I would say I would go to the BMA website. There's a shielding document there so um, that might be useful. Anything else that you guys wanted to, wanted to say? No, just good luck. <laughs> good luck to getting back and uh, or good luck we're not getting back for just yet, but um, yeah, hope people can start to enjoy the last of this bit of summer and getting a little bit of outside space and, you know, within the safe remits. And um, yeah, I just, as everyone, just hope that this is not, we don't have to come back to this because <laughs> I think the exhaustion of everyone is, uh, yeah, but well done, seriously. I. <laughs> Yeah. I'm not sure I could have done it so I think amazing and um yeah and really good luck with getting back and 
you know, good luck. It's literally from everyone, from medical students that haven't started their foundation doctor training um, to people who've had their CCTs delayed, people who haven't been able to do their exams, haven't been able to get their training. I'll just say good luck to everyone in getting back on the next path uh, for the future for you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, both of you. I hope everyone else has found that as, as useful as um, I have. Um, I'm just going to share some slides now um, to link to some of the resources and things. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, everybody. Um, if you've joined us in the live session, thank you for being such an active audience in the chat and the Q&A. It's been really, really useful for our speakers. If you're joining us for the recording session, thank you for doing so and for giving up your time. Please do watch the um, other sessions that are available if you think that they will be useful for you. And if there are things that you would like covered um, in future, please do suggest those to us. You can do that by going to slido.com, type in the event code hashtag topics, and you'll find a poll or a Q&A. Please do just jot down your thoughts or your suggestions um, there, and we'll do our best to act on them. Alongside these recordings, you'll also find um, some documents, including an education or supervisor or trainers um, checklist and flowchart guide um, if these will be useful for your um, ongoing supervision either while shielding or um, after and during your return please do have a look at those and um, see if they will be a helpful kind of guide for you there is a Facebook group um, which is not affiliated to Health Education England but is a useful source of um, sharing experiences and peer support. You'll find that by going to Shielding Healthcare Workers or by using the link bit.ly forward slash Shielding Healthcare with a capital S and capital H. The Twitter network, again, not affiliated with Health Education England, but a really good resource can be found at, at Shielding Doctors. And a project I'd like to mention um, that's been set up by a Shielding Doctor um, is the Distance Aware project. It's a visual um, symbol that can be um, generally recognised and um, hopefully we can make that as widespread as possible um, just to increase um, awareness really um, so if you are returning back to the clinical environment and you feel like this would be a useful visual um, cue that you would like to remain social distancing and for people to give you a little space um, please do go to www.bevancommission.org forward slash distance aware or type in at distance aware on twitter and you'll find some resources um, either downloadable um, symbols or um, links to access lanyards, badges, etc. that may be a useful visual cue for you um, as you return now or in the future. Many thanks again for joining us. It's been a pleasure and um, as Emma and Safina have said, good luck for the future um, and all of the changes that are coming up for our audience we know it's a really difficult time and thank you for um giving up your time to join us <laughs>